Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. So today I've got a 2019 Fender Player Jazz Bass on the bench. And you all know I'm not much of a bass player. I've dabbled with them from time to time, but I haven't done an in-depth setup on one. And so I thought, well, let me go out on the internet and see if I can't find some specs for setup on a Player Jazz Bass. And lo and behold, Fender has a Knowledge Bass article titled, how do I set up my bass guitar properly? So let's have some fun with this thing today and see how it goes. So what am I gonna do with this thing today? The person that I bought this from basically said it was a wall hanger and they didn't play it very often. And it's got plenty of dust on it and that kind of thing. But I think the thing that I can tell it needs the most is probably a neck adjustment. We'll check the specs out on the neck relief. And it might be the action that's the problem, but it does seem to have kind of high action right now. It doesn't seem to really need a string change. The strings are not worn at all. I think they're round wound strings, probably the factory strings. I'm gonna leave these alone. We're just gonna go through the setup process and see how that goes. Let's get started with the tools that Fender says we need. So Fender says that we need a set of automotive feeler gauges, 2000s to 25000s. I have a set of feeler gauges they're not automotive feeler gauges, they're just machinist feeler gauges. I know why they say that though, because the easiest place to find feeler gauges is going to be at the automotive parts store. Next, they say I need a 6 inch ruler with 132nd inch and 164th inch increments. I do happen to have a ruler like that. I've got this, it's a 12 inch ruler, and it's got both tenths of an inch and 30 seconds and 64ths of an inch. I don't use this a whole lot, and the reason I don't use it very much is because with all those lines on it, it's very hard to read. So I use a string gauge ruler or a action ruler, and it's got the 64th markings lined out on one of the edges, and I find that to be a lot easier to read. We're okay there. It says I need light machine oil. I doubt I'm going to end up using that, but I always keep a little bit of that around. I need a Phillips screwdriver, got a couple of those. I need an electronic tuner, obviously have that. Wire cutters, certainly have those. A peg winder, I don't have a base peg winder, but I do have fingers, so I think I'll be all right. Uh, polish and cloth, and so I obviously have those. Now, what does it not say on here? It says nothing about hex wrenches. You could not adjust the truss rod, and you could not adjust the bridge without some hex wrenches, so you need a set of those. And it does not say anything about a capo but I actually kind of cheated and went ahead and it mentions a capo in the instructions. So it's just not in their tools list, but it's something that I think you'll need. All right, so the first stage of the instructions after the tools section is about the strings themselves. Now I said I'm not changing strings on these today, but they mentioned that you should change your strings if they show wear where they press against the fret. Uh, if they become oxidized, rusty, or dirty, and will not tune properly to pitch. You know, they recommend running your finger along the bottom of the string, checking for flat spots. Sounds like a good idea to me. One thing to note, they do talk a little bit about string changes in here. They say that you should change these strings one at a time. I know that's, that's sometimes a preference that people do. Um, sometimes people take them all off and put them all on at the same time. It's just up to you, but I, I do agree with the suggestion that you should change these one at a time. Uh, the other thing that they mention is about cutting the strings to length. And since I'm not doing that here today, I'll just mention it. They talk about the amount of slack that you should leave on each string as you're cutting them to length when you're installing them. Now, what I normally do is two tuners worth of slack. Fender mentions that you should leave four inches worth of slack on each one of these strings. And guess what? Four inches is the distance between, basically, from, from one tuner to two tuners next to it. So one, two, three, that's four inches right there. So that's, that's exactly what I've been talking about. Just pull your string tight, cut it off at two tuners past the one that you're working on, and then back that string up, put the end of the string down in the hole for this vintage style tuner, wind it up, and you'll get that perfect, you know, two to three wraps basically on each tuner. Now I'll show you a picture on this one. Whoever put these strings on did not do that. I'm a little bit worried about this low E string. But, you know, it's holding, so I'll show you a picture of what that looks like as kind of a what-not-to-do thing, but I think it's going to be okay on this one for the time being. 
So the next section of the instructions here is about intonation. So you all have heard me say before, especially if you watch me build guitars from scratch, that the first string intonation, the rough setting is usually exactly the scale length of the instrument. So in this case, this being a 34 inch scale bass, I've already actually measured this out. This high string here is 34 inches away from the nut, exactly, this saddle is. What Fender says, and what I really didn't know, and I kind of learned something from this knowledge base article, is that the other saddles should go back by about the width of their string themselves. So, you know, this one's 34 inches, so this one is 34 inches plus the width of this string. And then from that starting point, this saddle goes back the width of this string. And then from that starting point, this saddle goes back the width of this string. So you can see the fall away like that. That fall away actually comes from the width of these strings themselves. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing I really never knew before. So thanks, Fender. I learned something. All right, the next part of the instructions is about the truss rod itself, essentially neck relief. So basically, what you should do as a starting point for adjusting your neck relief is figure out what is your neck radius because even according to fender specifications the truss rod relief varies by the amount of your neck radius you know if you have a popular base like this one you can look it up online and see the specs from you know any reseller or even the manufacturer themselves a fender player jazz bass has a nine and a half inch neck radius if you need to verify that grab yourself a cheap set of radius gauges and i like these because they go under the strings and get in there and measure your neck radius and this is indeed a nine and a half. So for a nine and a half inch neck radius Fender says the spec is twelve thousandths and this is we're talking about uh, neck relief. Neck relief is measured by putting a capo at the first fret and by fretting the guitar. I usually fret it at the neck to the body joint. Fender actually in their instructions says to fret it at the last fret. I don't think that's going to cause a huge difference, but there is some difference, I will say that. But at any rate, 9.5 is right on that border between 12 thousandths and 14 thousandths, so I think if I fret the guitar near the last fret, the difference in doing it there versus the very end of the neck is going to be less than 2 thousandths, and I don't have to worry about it too much. But right now, this bass has a ton of neck relief. I mean, it's double the spec, if not more. Basically, what I need to do here is reduce that amount of neck relief, which means I need to tighten the truss rod. Now, I do see why in the instructions, Fender might weasel out of including the Allen wrench as a tool you might need for this process. It's really because they're saying that the truss rod is adjusted by an Allen wrench for a guitar that has the adjustment at the headstock and it's adjusted by a Phillips screwdriver for a guitar with the adjustment of the neck joint. So yeah, okay, fine. You might have got away with that one, but you still need an Allen wrench on the bridge, so you can't get out of it completely. I'm gonna go ahead and give this thing a little bit of a tighten. Fender recommends that you detune and retune in between these adjustments. I'm gonna go ahead and just give it a little bit of a tweak or see if I can move it without that, just because I've done this so many times. Now, ideally, you'll count the number of turns that you put into the truss rod or taken out of the truss rod so you can put the guitar back to where it was when you started. But this one's so far out of whack. It just needs a healthy amount of tightening before I even get to a point where I can use it. So, let's see where we're at. Needs a lot more. All right, well, I think that sneaks us up on the perfect 12 thousandths. Now we can kind of go from here. All right, next spec in the Fender knowledge base is action. So action, they say, also depends on neck radius. So I showed you neck radius before is nine and a half. Their string height rule for the bass side is different than the treble side. The bass side is 664 and the treble side is 564. These are all to be measured at the 17th fret with a guitar tuned to pitch. Not too much different than a guitar, really. So you need your 64th ruler. I almost always flip the guitar into playing position for this because I hate bending down to look at this ruler. 
And on this guitar, the bass side is not too bad. It's almost a 664, but I can tell the next string is much higher. That one's over 7. Next one is 7. And the next one is over 8. So they're all over the place. So I need to find an Allen wrench to adjust these saddles. Okay, well I have my Allen wrench, or hex wrench, if you don't want to go with brand names. And the instructions say that you may end up having to shim the neck if you can't get the uh, specifications within you know, the, the recommended settings. And they also say that action is dependent upon the way that you play. So it says that players with a light touch can get away with lower action and others will need higher action to avoid rattles. So as I always say, action is player dependent depending upon what your preference is, whether you play you know, like they say, with a really heavy hand or, or not. And so these are factory specs and should be treated as such. But they're a good starting place for someone who's just starting out, doesn't have a preference, or if you're selling a guitar or something like that. You know, if nobody gives you their preferences, it's always best to go back to factory. All right, so on this one, let's see if we can adjust this first string down, or this bass string down to 6 ths it doesn't need much of an adjustment, just a little bit. Now when you're adjusting these, try to keep your saddle level because there's two sides, there's a, a, a screw on each side and you want to try to adjust them the same amount. Again, when you're doing these, count your turns and then you can always go back to where they were before. Okay, that's right on the money for 6 ths They want 5 ths on the treble side and then you'll need to sort of guesstimate the middle ones somewhere in between five and six and again they don't list the spec so this one's going to be to your preference I usually try to stick with 664 on the top two and 564 on the bottom two or when I'm doing a guitar I'll do the first three strings one way and the second three set of three strings the other way and that way you know kind of gives me somewhere to, to land every time I do a setup Okay, well, I've got everything set to spec, and I've got everything tuned to pitch. So, the thing that I like to do on a guitar, whenever I get to this point, is check and make sure I don't have any rattles in the strings from the 12th fret on up. So I'm going to try that on this bass and just see where I'm at. Alright, well, no rattles, no dead frets, you know, nothing skipped a note or anything like that. So, everything seems okay to me. now. Whoever owns this bass in the future may want to change this setup, but this is a great place to leave it to start with. So the last thing that Fender says in the specs is that I should check pickup height. So there's a statement in here that says that setting pickups too high can cause a number of unusual occurrences. And to be honest folks, that scares the heck out of me. So let's avoid that at all costs. The Jazz has two pickups, so I've got to do this twice. And like any other Fender guitar, they recommend that you depress the strings at the last fret and measure from there. And the specification that they give for a standard J, which is a jazz bass, is 7 64ths on the bass side and 5 64ths on the treble side. Again, factory specs don't leave me any hateful comments. But that's where I'm going with this. And I, you know, you've seen me do this with Allen wrenches in the past. Um, I do find that to be relatively easy, but you can also just use your 64th ruler for this. And again, if I was doing that, flip the bass up into playing position and measure. And this bridge pickup is already at 7 64ths. This middle or neck pickup is a little bit too high. One thing I'll say about these. These are direct mounted pickups. Now on a pick guard mounted pickup, you might do this a little bit differently, but with direct mounting, the pickups are screwed straight into the wood. So tightening them is gonna bring them closer to the wood, tightening the screws, and loosening the screws is gonna bring the pickups further away from the wood. Now one thing I will say, 
I don't know what's under these pickups. It could be some really old foam or it could be some rubber or it could be a spring. As you're loosening these, if you're trying to bring them away from the body, just make sure that they're actually moving away from the body from the force of whatever is underneath them. Sometimes that stuff can get a little bit old and worn out and you may have to sort of pull up on it with your fingers or you may have to replace whatever it is completely. So new spring, new foam, whatever. Now let's see how this one reacts when I try to raise it. Yeah, it's staying where it is. Let's see if I can coax it up with my fingers a little bit. It needs just a hair more. Okay, that's got me my 764 on this side. Basically what I'm saying is whatever's underneath this pickup is not providing enough force to move the pickup away from the body by itself. I had to kind of help it up a little bit. It's, it's staying there pretty well, but if it was flopping around at this point, I would definitely want to take this thing apart and replace the spring or whatever's under there. Let's go ahead and do the last string. Okay, well the bridge is good. The neck needs to be a little closer to the body, so I'm going to screw this in a little bit more. It still needs a little bit more. It's fighting me a little bit, so I'm going to lay the base down to do this. One more turn. And when I say turn, I'm going about a quarter at a time just to make sure I don't overdo it. Okay, that's 5 fourths. So now my pickup height is set for both pickups. And the last thing they, they talk about in the instructions is intonation, so let's go ahead and just check that out. Alright, so to fine tune the intonation, you basically need your tuner and a screwdriver. A lot of people say you're supposed to do this in playing position. Fender actually doesn't mention that in their instructions. One thing that I will say, if you're using a neck block like this, something that I've started doing is moving the neck block closer to the body joint so that it's affecting the neck less. So, you know, this section between this, this stand and the neck joint itself is very short, should be very stable. So that helps mitigate some of the effect of leaving the guitar laying on its back like this. But you can flip it up if you want. It's just really hard for me to show you what's going on in that position. Fender says, pretty much everybody says, to check intonation, you're comparing the harmonic at the 12th fret to the fretted note at the 12th fret. And you want to tune your harmonic first. So I'm pretty much spot on there and check your 12th fret fretted note. It is just a hair sharp and when I say a hair it's vacillating back and forth between sharp and not sharp. So I might just leave that there but if you want to get picky about it anytime the note's sharp you want to tighten the saddle up to lengthen the string and typically you do this without string pressure on it but it's just a small adjustment in this case. Okay, after tuning the harmonic, I've got everything spot on now. Try that again on the next string. Okay, on this one, the fretted note is a little bit flat. I'm going to adjust the saddle accordingly. Okay, well I've got that one with inspect now. It just required me uh, loosening this screw about a turn. The saddle is still behind the first string. Probably not the width of the string itself. So you can sort of see the difference between a recommended starting point and the actual, you know, what the value ends up being in reality. Just continue on with that process for the rest of these strings. Okay, well no adjustment required on the last one. So anyway, everything looks good. Uh, I'd say the intonation is pretty spot on from the factory actually, but it is not quite exactly what Fender said it would be on the rough end, so just something to be aware of. Well that's it for the Fender instructions, but there's one curious note in here that I'm wondering if you all might be able to help me with. It says in here that with most tuning keys it's preferable to tune up to pitch, which I do that all the time, that's the way I thought you were supposed to do it, but it says that with locking tuners that it's preferable to go past the note and tune down to the pitch. I'm wondering why that is, so anybody who has a comment and can answer that question, I'd love to hear the answer. Okay, well thanks Fender, I now have a properly set up jazz bass. 
So I appreciate you guys following me. I appreciate you guys liking and commenting on my videos. And I appreciate most of all the subscriptions. So thanks a lot and I'll see you guys next time.